This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Oli Tikkanen. And this episode continues the explorations of qualitative research methods that have been previously held in this podcast. Today, we focus on the issues of validity in qualitative research. Qualitative researchers in sport, exercise and physical activity have disagreed on what are the best ways to address validity of qualitative research and even on whether validity is an appropriate concept for qualitative research at all. I will be discussing with Dr. Nora Ronkainen from University of Uvascula and Dr. Gareth Wiltshire from Loughborough University, who have published a paper together titled Rethinking Validity in Qualitative Sport and Exercise Psychology Research, a Realist Perspective. We will explore what they consider as the main problems in how researchers have addressed validity and what they think would be a more promising way forward. Welcome, Nora and Garrett. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Hello. So we have had some interesting episodes about qualitative research. And in this episode, we could go deeper into validity of qualitative research. You have written a paper about it. Could you tell the story, where did the idea to this paper came, and how did you end up working together? Gareth, would you like to start on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do find it a really, really interesting topic, and it's a kind of one of those issues which is, you know, validity and reliability is one of those things that you learn right at the start of learning about research methods, isn't it, back at your undergraduate degree. So lots of conversations about validity and reliability and it's quite well um, uh, established and there's a good amount of agreement on validity and reliability in what it seems like it from um, quantitative research. In qualitative research however it's much more contentious it's really really one of those things which is um, highly debated lots of people um, reject the idea um, and it's actually quite challenging to, to to conceptually think about. So, within this context, I guess I guess you can think about you know what is qualitative research trying to do, and what is the topics of qualitative research, and and, and why is it such uh, a difficult thing to think about? And for me, I guess one of the things is when you're when you're doing qualitative research, you're really at the edges. You're really at the um, at, at the fine margins of of topics which are highly interpreted, okay. So, so the, the things you're talking about lend themselves to interpretation very much. So, um, for example, I was on Twitter yesterday and I saw a tweet from the All Blacks um, rugby team, and they they quote tweeted a um, a tweet from the uh, the NFL a little video from the National Football League showing a video of of when American football players tackle without helmets and without um, without shoulder guards. Um, and it was in this original tweet, it the video seemed like, oh, look how brave they are, look how hard, tough and masculine they are. And then the All Blacks tweeted this saying, um, just one word, cute, and then a, a sort of smiley face with some with some love hearts. So if we, as a qualitative researcher, you kind of look at that, and that is a bit of text, isn't it? Um, so you can kind of look at look at that and um, wonder what that means. What were the All Blacks trying to say when they wrote "cute"? Uh, was it appropriate? What are all the, um, the 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 meanings around masculinity and sport and and toughness, which meant that they were um, they were able to say uh, "cute"? And was it right they they did that? Now. The, the reason for I'm giving this as an example is that um, it shows that actually some people would have really loved that tweet. 
Uh, some people wouldn't have uh, liked it at all. I think it might bring up ideas about um, how unsafe it is to, 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 to do these things and promoting kind of violence in sport. But what they meant by it would be interpreted in so many different ways. So it's actually very, very difficult when you're, when you're dealing with material which is highly interpretive to, um, to check whether your, your findings and your claims are valid or not. So it becomes a very, very sort of contentious and messy idea in qualitative research. And we can talk about um, what has led to this, but we believe that it's, it's come from this uh, paradigms approach where a qualitative and quantitative research are really seen as operating in different paradigms. So the paradigmatic landscape in sport and exercise psychology, for example, has uh, largely positioned qualitative research as, uh, as, as as being grounded in these different paradigmatic assumptions. So these, these are around your research philosophy, your basic philosophical beliefs involving ontology and epistemology. And, um, and, and these things have, have, have meant that qualitative research moves away from the, the very idea of validity, the very idea that you can find w- what the All Blacks actually meant with that tweet and that there is one truth around that tweet. Um, so I guess separately, um, I was thinking about th- these ideas, and Nora was thinking about these ideas as well, and then we bumped into each other at the Qualitative Research in Sport and Exercise Conference in Vancouver, and uh, in 2018, I think that was, and um, uh, immediately we began talking about this stuff and uh, began thinking about ideas and, and, and realizing that we had quite similar ideas on this. And importantly, that we didn't feel like many other people had the same ideas and we were kind of operating in a, in a, in a uh, fairly novel space. So it was quite obvious quite quickly that we should sort of work together. And um, uh, Nora's presentation at the conference was largely around this topic as well, which I attended and I thought it was brilliant. Um, and so quite quickly after that, we, we started working. And I think you can remind me, Nora, but I'm pretty sure we had a draft of this within something like six weeks of, of meeting each other for the first time. Yeah, I, I think we were very, very quick to write it up as, as the first draft, just like you said. And I think that was because we both had separately spent quite a lot of time thinking about that. And uh, well, I guess reflecting on my my journey, and we are kind of around. Uh, we've completed our PhDs around the same time, and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, I think we have been lucky in the sense that we don't have to be justifying like why would you do qualitative research at all. That in our time, it's it's widely accepted that qualitative research is valuable, and 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 it can give us these kind of insights that you cannot. Uh, get with quantitative research. So for example, when I've done studies which only have one participant, only rarely I would get a reviewer saying that, you know, your N is one, so you cannot, like, this doesn't offer any value. So we are not anymore discussing that kind of issues. Mm. But then when we are talking about validity, just like you already talked about the landscape, that's something that is very very contested and I became aware of that very early in my PhD journey and we had research group meetings where you have people who are positioning their work different in in different paradigms as as you mentioned and and we would have a lot of debates about these things and funny enough uh, for my PhD uh, defense that I I had that in in Denmark in Aarhus. One of my opponents was Brett Smith, who is the um, he's he's been a leading scholar in in qualitative research in sport and exercise psychology and and sports social sciences more broadly. And in Denmark, you would get like a list of questions and comments from your opponents before. And and one of Brett's questions was that he wanted to me to think about validity more and and that we would have a discussion about that in in the defense so we would have a uh, 20 minutes that he would ask me questions and now trying to defend my work and at that point i had already figured out that the, my work broadly sits within this realist 
understanding of science and realist understanding of qualitative research, but definitely it wasn't like extremely well developed at that point. And I've kept working on that on the side, but I think when we then met and uh, had the chance to discuss and, and saw that we have similar ideas and they haven't really been taken up in, in the sport and exercise psychology discourse, which is where my work mainly sits. And so we saw that there's an opportunity for us to offer a contribution that we were hoping that will bring some further debates in, in, in this area. Exactly. That's a very interesting story how you ended up writing the paper together. So what I what I got from Garrett saying is that validity is highly debated in qualitative research and and it's interesting that it's the things are highly interpretative so it makes the validity a little bit difficult. So how would you say what is validity and how validity can be defined in qualitative research. Nora, would you like to go on this one first? Yeah, well, <laughs> such a terrible question. And, and that comes to qualitative research as being very contested uh, space, just like we already discussed. So we have qualitative researchers who reject the whole idea of validity or the, the concept of validity, that they would say that we shouldn't use that concept in qualitative research at all, that they would prefer to talk about quality of qualitative research or rigor is one of the terms that is used more often. So basically, I think we will go into kind of some of the challenges and some of the issues that we have been uh, identifying in, in the relativist approach, which is the main way that these issues of quality, rigor, validity have been addressed in in the sport and exercise psychology discourse where we are we developed our paper but then our our own ideas then sit more within that realist approach so i'm not sure if we want to start discussing these differences right away or what would be the best way to proceed yeah well uh, i i think um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very simple question ollie uh, so, uh, and so and there's a complex answer to it so this is a, a case of whether we have an oversimplified answer to it or or we kind of build into it an, a little bit um, and and it really i think it depends on um, like what you are what you imagine your the phenomenon to to be and how close you can get to it. So, I mean, in a very simplistic way, the, the simple answer um, might be um, less contentious uh, in, in many ways. So, if I was to um, I was to make a judgment on um, somebody else, so an, another human that I am talking to. Um, imagine if I, if you're a, a researcher, then the other human that you're talking to could be the uh, the interviewee, your your participant, um, and let's say the the participant is is feeling um, quite uh, quite happy on that day. They're they're in a good mood, um, but me as a as a researcher, if if I come in and somehow get something wrong, and and I think that they are uh, they are stressed out, um, then uh, and I and I say, are you? Uh, I, are you, are you stressed out today? Is there something going going uh, going on that I can help with? Um, I, I'm making a claim. I'm making an assumption about their mood, and I'm actually getting it wrong. Okay, so so if uh, if you make that that judgment, you're making a, a claim about what you think is happening, and it's it doesn't match the the actual experience of that of that participant, then your 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 claim you can say then would be not valid. So I think in a in a in a straightforward sense, you can think about um, validity in terms of how closely you might be um, representing or or um, inferring um, the reality of what's going on, what's truly going on in that in that person, and are you using all your um, interpretive powers as as a as an interpretive researcher or human to to, to, to get to get close to that and have you made any mistakes so on that simple sense I suppose um, that's that's a little bit less 
contentious. So I'm sort of happy to start there and then maybe um, uh, expand on that and the problems with that description a little bit further. I wonder if Nora would agree with that example as a basic starting point for validity there? Yeah, I, I think, well, in our paper, we would then talk about this, um, what you are describing as interpretive validity that mm -hmm. we have understood uh, our participants' intentions and meanings. Um, I guess another quite simple example, I, I hoped it would be funny for some people. I, I What I had in the qualitative research conference was that, you know, we we were living in the UK at that time and we were often traveling around with our camper van. And sometimes you have a sign that there's a weak bridge ahead of you and it has a certain number. It says that only like if your vehicle is heavier than this, then you shouldn't drive over the bridge. And so when you are thinking about whether you should be driving over the bridge or not, you want to be very confident that the engineers have actually got it right. Mm -hmm. That if, if our camper van is actually not that heavy, we want to be fairly feeling quite confident that, okay, it's safe for us to drive over the bridge. So that would be a valid assessment of how much the bridge can carry. And so then I was kind of saying that, yeah, well, of course, we know that things are different in human sciences. You know, people are more complicated than a bridge and things are highly contextual and complex and so forth. That's what we always talk about in qualitative research. But then on the other hand, is it is it really so different if we think, for example, of athlete mental health is now one very big topic and we think about an athlete who who is depressed and we are trying to figure out what kind of interventions might be the best interventions to help that athlete. And we actually want to be as confident as possible that the intervention that we are choosing is going to benefit that individual and at least it's not going to harm that individual and make their situation worse. So in that way, even if we know that human world is very complex, we still want to find trust and confidence that our research has identified accurately what are the issues at stake. And if we do a certain kind of intervention, we have some expectation that it's going to bring some good outcomes. Yeah, exactly. And just to follow up on that, it's reminded me of, of something, some content we had in an earlier version of the paper, where we really argued that exactly what you've just said, that research needs to be in this position where it has, um, where you can adjudicate in different levels of confidence on the research claims. It's really, really crucial because research is held in a, a privileged position. Um, the, the findings that researchers, research papers come up with and the things that researchers say, the advice that is given, is held in quite high esteem uh, compared to, for example, the, the advice of a lay person, sometimes the advice of a coach, the advice of a, a of a fellow athlete or a, a parent, for example. Um, the advice given from a researcher is held in, in, in higher esteem, I believe, than, than from other sources. So there's a responsibility then to, to have this greater level of conf confidence in, in what, what we're saying is, uh, and the, the advice we're giving is good advice and um, having the, at least the potential of being able to, to rule out or dismiss some bad advice. Yeah, those, those were very good points on, on the validity and importance of validity also in qualitative research. So what do you see as the problem with the existing popular views on, on validity in qualitative research? Would you, Carrot, like to go first on this one? I suppose the, the first thing to say on this is that... Um, is that we're kind of talking generally around the relativist position, um, but to 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 mention that it's very it's, it's very it's very difficult to separate that from the authors perhaps who um, who, who write from this position and uh, and and have presented the views on validity so far. Um, 
so so in in a sense i think it'd be good to have a a, a, a critical discussion as what we see as as the problems with it but also in a way that's respectful to the authors that have been presenting it so i i just kind of want to have a bit of a, a preamble to say that we don't uh, certainly don't have anything personally against the people who have um, uh, written about this topic and have promoted the relativist position. So in the paper, we, we name the authors that, um, that, that, that we focus on. And we did that in order to, to really try not to create a straw person argument. We really wanted to, to look deeply at what was being said and to use the words that are being said as they were presented and, and, and try to, to look at what we see as the problems um, using using the words that, that were used by the authors. Um, but that's all, all, all is to say that uh, they certainly don't have anything personal against these authors at all. We've, um, for example, we, we, we look at one of the papers comes from Andrew Sparks uh, from 1998. Um, and anyone who's involved in, in, in qualitative research in sport, exercise and health, whether it's in psychology, sociology, pedagogy, everyone will know um, Andrew Sparks. His work has been um, for a long time very well regarded, well respected. And I came at his work through um, one of my lecturers at master's level called Carly Stewart. And they've done some work on autobiographies together. And it's really, really powerful stuff and it's a hugely hugely uh, important scholar and then um a long-term colleague um it, it seems from from the publications um the work with andrew sparks was brett smith and uh, again similarly you, you can't go go about learning anything in sport exercise and health without coming across the the, the papers from Brett Smith, and uh, I would regard Brett Smith as one of the figures that has uh, really um, not only inspired me, um, but also given me um, and a number of other early career researchers a, a very generous amount of, of, of time to kind of help our thinking and to uh, support, appreciate, and also promote our, our work as well, and his work around narrative typologies with um, people with spinal cord injuries. I remember being sort of fascinated by, by, by reading that work. And also, um, uh, you know, is one of those people who, when you hear him speak or yeah, if, he, if he gives a, a lecture or a talk, you can't help but being sort of energized by um, after listening to his work. And then the, the last paper on a relativist approach was, um, it, it also involved, um, Kerry McGannon um, and uh, and her work similarly has been has been very very um, important very highly regarded. Um, remember the last paper I read from hers was around um, a discourse analysis of um, uh, how organisations related to the NFL responded to Donald Trump's um, Donald Trump's response to the um, to the, the the Colin Kaepernick. Um, racial discrimination protests in, in the US and really a really important topic and, and ex expertly kind of um, uh, expertly researched as well. Um, so we certainly have a huge amount of respect for the, the, the authors that are presenting their relativist approach. So what, what we wanted to do is really try and evaluate what was being said in this relativist approach. And, and we're going to, I think we can kind of unpack the um, the arguments as they are and perhaps sort of depersonalize them a little bit and separate them so in terms of what what did we see as the issues and what did we see as the problems uh, I think a general way of stating that would be that the general basis is that the scientific caricature of validity and scientism is the idea that you can reach some sort of objective truth okay some single version of reality and you're you're aiming to get to um to, to true statements and that is being highly contested within qualitative research because of the paradigmatic approach that we that we've that we've talked about because it's simply an impossible task so there are so many different interpretations that you simply it, it's simply not a worthwhile 
term anymore. And usually what is presented, and uh, this, this isn't necessarily what um, the authors say in their papers, but if you look at relativism more broadly, relativists would sometimes say that, um, uh, let's say the example of a, a table that might, might be in, in front of you, a wooden table that's in front of you seems to be like a, a wooden table, but if you choose to sit on it, then does it become a chair? Also, if you pick it up and throw it at someone, does it become a weapon? To a small insect, it might not be a table at all. It might be something to, to climb up onto, something to, to, to rest on. So to depending on the perspective that you're taking and depending on the, um, the, the observer, it really breaks down the idea that that table can actually be one thing. So that's the sort of starting position. Um, and that because of that, it ends up totally rejecting the idea of the scientific idea of this objective version of truth. But what we began to really um, grapple with is um, seeing that as essentially another end of an extreme. Okay, so going from one version of, um, of this scientific objective idea of maybe a correspondence theory of truth all the way to a relativistic notion of truth where you can't make any statements which are outside of the observer, outside of the interpreter. There are so many, an infinite amount of different interpretations of what is what the world is like that um, you actually lose all the, um, the scaffolding which allows one interpretation to be better than another. So this is, in the paper, we, we refer to this as the anything goes problem. And this is something which we looked carefully at it in the, the, the work on relativism in qualitative research and, and really found it difficult to, um, to, to, to understand how to avoid the idea that anything goes. Okay, so any, anything goes by that, by that what we mean is um, all interpretations are equally valid. Okay, so if, um, if a, you're looking at a cat sitting on a mat, then um, if someone else, uh, if one person says the cat is sitting on the mat and someone else says the, the cat is not sitting on the mat, how are you um, adjudicating between which one of those is right? How are you ruling out one of those perspectives uh, over another? Because it, unless you have some idea that that, uh, that not all interpretations are equally valid, and if you have a good reason for that, then then you're not in a position to, to rule out that the cat is not sitting on the mat. So it becomes sitting on the mat and also not sitting on the mat at the same time. And there are various sort of paradoxes that are associated with this, which we kind of go into a bit of detail in, in the paper as well. Yeah, I guess to continue a little bit on that we clearly see from from the work of these relativist scholars and and what Garrett already what you said is that I've also been highly influenced by these scholars and they've done some really wonderful work that has also helped me to think about narratives and cultural sports psychology and and they've really done this foundational work also to make qualitative research acceptable and and just like i said that we don't have to be justifying in our work why to do qualitative research at all and and big part of that is because of the foundational work that the scholars have done who we are whose work we are now kind of uh, using to uh in, in our paper to kind of explore what are some of these problems. But to continue on that, like I said, that we certainly don't think that, that the scholars in their actual work are just taking anything goes. They certainly have, or they are discriminating between different, uh, different interpretations. But our problem is that we don't see how you can really do that. So, um, for example, some of those examples, what to do when you are working from a relativist perspective and, and, and thinking about validity would be that you would have, for example, um, member reflections and, and uh, critical friends. But so critical friends is something that 
is really often used now in qualitative research. But if you have four critical friends and you work with all of them, and all of them have a different interpretation, then we really didn't see guidance in, in this relativist approach in terms of you have these five different views from yourself and your four critical friends, but which one of those interpretations is going to feature in, in your research report and which ones are you going to then disregard and, and what's the basis for for making these judgments? And that was something that we couldn't really find uh, from the work that we were looking into. Yeah, those were interesting things on, on what's 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 the problem with relativist approach that you can have infinite amount of interpretation and there's a problem of anything goes before we go to new approach you are proposing would you like to add anything into this problem with the existing views yeah i mean we were also attending uh this workshop on on these issues in the in the qualitative research conference a couple of years ago and i think one thing that we talked about there was if you go with the relativist approach that different perspectives have different ways to think about validity and they can have like different lists that they use in terms of this is my list of criteria for I'm doing autoethnography and I have these uh, criteria and you have your list whereas somebody who's working with a different approach as well as a different paradigm they will have a different list of uh, criteria and that's something that is can be very confusing for a reviewer and and especially for for the general public so if you have a research report and it's said that this is valid within this paradigm but it's not necessarily valid with that other paradigm that that creates a very very confused situation in terms of how can we use this knowledge in in the real world yeah, I, w I would agree. I think that is a kind of a, 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 one of the practical problems and, and realities of uh, perhaps going down the, the, the paradigms approach as being a, uh, a solution to disagreements. Um, yeah. Because I think in the, in the real world, people don't necessarily care what paradigm we're, we're operating in. So I suppose, uh, we're starting with your example at, 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 at the beginning, where you talked about depression in athletes. I think the athlete experiencing depression and the person close to, to, to that athlete who, who really care for that athlete, they want some good advice. They want, they want, they want to uh, be um, able to be in a position to, to improve that experience, to, to, to relieve uh, and ameliorate some of the, the depressive symptoms that the person is experiencing and base it on some good research. So if you have two different um, pieces of research which which maybe contradict each other, you know who do you who do you go with? And if and, and if they are both operating in different paradigms, I think uh, it's very hard to, to to adjudicate which which one which 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 approach is more more appropriate and, and, and more rigorous and trustworthy. Which which approach do you do you go with? Because that is the really in my view, the the only reality that that matters. So to privilege different uh, research approaches in different ways based on the the criteria that can simply be sort of selected by uh, individual researchers and and their, and their chosen stated paradigm, I think is quite quite problematic. But yeah, I guess uh, the other thing to say is that is that um, I think what we what we really wanted to do we mentioned. Um, you know, almost trying to depersonalize this a little bit. But we wanted to to to, to present a a an argument about relativism, which has not really received um, not really received uh, attention in 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 this way in the literature at all. So it so it seems that the relativist position has criticized positivist, post positivist and realist positions for some time, but have not themselves received the same critique, the same level of scrutiny. So 
uh, we certainly wanted to explore that idea. What happens when you uh, object and present counter arguments to this position? And um, and it's interesting now because when I say when I say depersonalize it, it's because some time has passed now. So uh, Nora and I can kind of look back at the paper and see it as a kind of you know objective artifact now that is kind of out there. And I just reread it yesterday, um, and now it sits there as as not you know, as as our views kind of change a little bit and it, and evolve. It sits there as a critique. Uh, from a, rel a realist perspective, um, a critique of relativism. So the uh, it's become less of a kind of um, a kind of personal um, view, and actually presenting something which is out there in the literature, which counters counters the argument. And of course, it's really really important for all research communities to to have a, this competition of ideas for, for for things to be presented, which which do. Uh, critique, uh, critique the relativist position, um, and to kind of keep others in check, and, and we would we would expect for the same to be to be done with with, with our the realist position that we we have presented here. So there are there are other um, things that that we want to bring to the table that haven't really been explored, and and those things um, are in the paper, but they're, they are basic ideas. For example, criticisms of, of relativism being the idea that there are these internal paradoxes and, and, and contradictions within relativism, which are quite difficult to escape. And one of them, which is quite, I don't know whether fun is the right word, might be quite, quite fun to think about for, for some people. If you imagine, uh, two people, you have a, a relativist on the one hand and a realist on the other hand. And the relativist says that um, uh, multiple they believe in multiple truths, and the uh, realist believes in in uh, an objective version of truth. Then, uh, from the relativist, if the relativist is 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 right, and there are multiple truths, that also involves the realist's idea. So, included within the relativist position has to be the, the idea that you cannot actually reject the the realist position as well. So in this way, you've kind of got this um, kind of paradox, which which is which is difficult to escape out of. And this has been uh, sort of well presented and, and, uh, and well understood within philosophy for a long time. But that's something which has not necessarily been picked up um, with, with critiques in the um, sport and exercise literature. So we were sort of wanted to, to, to put those things out there in the space as well. Yeah, I, I think we definitely don't have the time to discuss all of these, but what we come down to when we are discussing these issues that we have identified with relativism, that uh, at the end, one of the arguments that we were looking at was that all the studies have to be coherent in their, in their philosophy, in in their theory, in their methods, and, and so forth. And if you take this coherence principle, then we were seeing these uh, points where the relativist approach is actually incoherent, and that was what Garrett was talking about. And I guess another thing in, in research context as well is that you can have a coherent approach in terms of your theory and methods and, and, and your positioning, but you might still reach the wrong conclusions. So. Coherence is something that we need, but it also doesn't guarantee that we have accurately understood what is going on in the real world. But yeah, I, just like I said, we probably don't have all the all the time in the world to explore uh, those issues, but hopefully we have given an overview of, of the arguments that we have put forth in, in the paper. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you're using. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show, it would be great help for us. 
we have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.